and um, and it says this, a body is the physical body of an individual, which kind of then directly implies an individual has identity as well. And identity is really interesting when it comes to evolution. So if you have, don't necessarily have identity, but if you have different E. coli bacteria um, from having a shell, but a body or some sort of kind of border between them and the DNA, the information kind of like working inside, um, they're subjected to pressure and one of them might kind of perform better than the other one. And because they're subject to evolution, they're gonna, there's kind of like processes that happen between them. So identity is a really interesting thing. And um, it's, something, it's something that's actually not really, it's not really acknowledged in today's synthetic biology. And that's actually quite interesting if you go back to the living in time thing, if you look at um, long running experiments. So um, there's actually, as far as I know, one long term evolution experiment, which is in Richard Lensky's lab at Michigan State University, which has been running from 1988 till now. And that's, um, I mean, I don't know what now is when I found this, but it's quite recently. So they had been at 50,000 generations. So what they do is basically they just let them live, basically, and kind of every day that they, they kind of take a sample and put it in another in another um, glass vessel so basically they kind of keep replicating them and but they don't they don't mix them so like like they're kind of numbered so a3 a4 a5 so they always stay the same so they can actually see what happens over these 50,000 generations in terms of evolution and one thing that happened you <laughs> again you don't really see it, but number a3 is quite cloudy and that's because it's actually learned to live on citric acid, which is something that um, nobody had predicted, and which actually shows that even in these simple machines, um, or like, I mean, even machines, and I'm saying it as well, in these simple things, there's quite a lot of evolution going on. And if you use them as machines, then you have to kind of, you have to deal with it. And that's actually quite an interesting thing, because over time, and it's kind of borrowed from Bruno Latour, um, and he in turn borrowed it from cybernetic ideas by Norbert Wiener and, and similar people. Um, over time, evolution may actually be black boxing life like machines. So you have a life like machine, and they always talk about like um, metabolic pathways that you use, like in the same way you would use flowcharts in, in engineering. But over time, they. Oops. Sorry. No. Google's asking something. Um, over time, they're actually gonna they're gonna become messier, and messier. And over time, they actually would look like a flowchart. Might might at some point actually look like that. And if you go back to the car example, like say you design a car, and it drives, or like the biological car. I mean, not saying it's gonna be a biological car, but like the biological machine is continue to work over time, especially if you kind of like frame it in the right way. But at some point, you will n not necessarily be able to understand your own creation anymore. So you have to, like after a couple of years, you will have to do science on your own design again to understand how it actually works, even though it might work better, but you, it's kind of a, it's become a mess, basically, because that's, that's, how, that's how biology works. Um, so that's a radically different idea from, if you think about like elegance in, in, in engineering and design, that's like a radical, radically different idea of elegance. So there's like a couple, there's a couple questions that emerge from that. So if you look at a lifelike machine, and lifelike, I'm, I'm borrowing that from Sharif Mansi, who's gonna talk later, who I'm uh, working with in um, the Synthetic Aesthetics Project, where we're kind of looking at these things, where also actually all these questions came from our, eventually came from our um, conversations. Um, lifelike machine has a certain boundary, but what's the boundary of that, um, of the system, so like, I would say you rather have to look at like a, the whole system to actually um, to find a boundary if there is one. And then it's, there's also the question of what the relation is between um, design and contingency, and its creation and function. And so contingency is a um, scientific term for randomness, and it's a bit more complicated. But there's like, in people who research the origins of life, there's like a certain there's a certain debate, or there's a big debate actually between. Um, determinism and contingency. To, so determinism means like the laws of nature are in a way that like the emergence of life was kind of eventual and contingency says like well um, it's quite likely factors but like that they came together in that way is very unlikely. So um, contingency is basically randomness. So you basically reintroduce randomness in, 
and like engineering things. So, and lastly, can we actually cope with that? Do we want that? Do we want to build machines that after some time um, we might not necessar necessarily understand anymore? We have to take steps to kind of understand them again, which um, this is a good example in beer brewing, actually, because beer brewing, because they're using yeast, um, they're doing similar things. And what they do is that they kill all the yeast at some point because it's been it's evolved and the beer changes taste, so they basically reset the whole batch, which is one one version to cope with it. Um, then I think if you want to look at the boundaries again of such a machine, then you have to look at the whole thing. So the lifelike machine is kind of a combination that emerges up from um, the information, which is kind of what's that's which is the DNA, obviously, which is kind of like the old school genetic engineering view. And then you have the materiality of it, which is a bit more like synthetic biology style. So basically, you understand how things work, and you kind of use with you use like natural materials, so kind of like existing life forms. Um, but then you also have time, which is evolution, basically. So like over time, things are going to change, and then you have the environment, um, which exerts selective pressure on whatever you did. So basically, you have to have you have to situate these things in, in an environment to kind of guide them. Um, so it's a system, basically. And if you, if you look at that again, I would propose to actually call it contingency engine because um, kind of like riffing on Charles Babbage's difference engine, which is like one of the first, if you don't count the Greek thing, that's the first computer, basically. Um, so to kind of to make a system that basically takes all of these things into account and kind of say like, well, the whole the machine would be rather this kind of contingency en engine than as isolated parts. And there's actually one predecessor that I could find. It's actually the only thing I could find, which is one of the predecessors as well of this um, long-running evolution experiment, of the Lensky experiment. And this might provide like a hint to a first step in that direction. And it's actually um, it's Reverend William Dellinger's controlled evolution experiment from 1880 to 1886. Which is quite interesting because the guy was a priest, so that um, kind of says something in itself. And what he did is basically that he took, um, I don't know what, but he took some bacteria and he exposed it to growing, um, to growing temperatures. So they would die at, I think, 60 degrees, and he kind of, over time, he like slowly, slowly raised the temperature um, over the six years. And in the end, he ended up with um, bacteria that could take 90 degrees. So he kind of like, pushed evolution in a certain way with this really beautiful furniture-like thing. Um, <laughs> so um, going back to the Rubino, Rubinov quote, of which I actually um, withheld half, um, nature will be known and remade through technique and will finally become artificial just as culture becomes natural. For such a project to be brought to fruition, it would stand as the basis for overcoming the nature-culture split. Um, and I think that's a really crucial point because um, in, in the piece we have in the show, we basically say like, well, we take what we consider nature and we're going to make it culture through kind of like dragging it into the realm of technology. But actually such a, if you want to call it like plastic machine is like the, the thing we, uh, we saw before, there's maybe like even an inverse, there's like a dual effect. So. Um, in a way, like if, if we let that happen, so if we actually want machines that are much more um, fluid and kind of like part of a system, much more than kind of classical engineering, like building a bridge, um, we become more natural in turn, if you know what I mean. Um, and then lastly, or almost lastly, um, back to this <laughs> image you still can't see. Um, I think it's quite interesting to think about um, that also like in this in this thing there might be a reverse happening because um, what you see here is in a way if you look at the long term thing is in a way also like a move from something like agriculture to industrial or industrialization and since we're dealing with like kind of massive amounts of living things I would say kind of like slightly provocatively that there might actually also be like a move back to something like agriculture because like suddenly you're dealing with like living things again that you're using to like produce something and you need to kind of like look after you know like bacteria shepherd uh, husbandry and um so there's like really weird things that that kind of emerge from that 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 are not really currently addressed in the science of these things because they're 
they're very keen on on making them making them look like like the kind of like next step of the computer re revolution, even though you kind of arguably dealing with very different things, i.e. live. Um, and then lastly, there's not so much to say, uh, not so much to see either. Um, so Sharif and his lab, or like some of his PhD students are actually working on, um, we're looking at colors and how colors change, to maybe like take that into, into like one of the results of the synthetic aesthetics residency that we're both part of. And um, there's a really nice picture of water bubbles with E. coli expressing gene fluorescent protein inside. So basically it's like the artificial bubble or the artificial like identity war between different like colonies of bacteria and we're going to look at how these change in the long term so that's it's kind of a hint at future things. So I don't know, the clock stopped, I don't know how much time I took. Yeah? Cool. Q&A? <laughs> Thank you.